Please don't be concerned too much. It's not going to be a 30-minute presentation. And it, I hope it's a pleasant surprise for you. I will take uh, less of your time. Also, we have very many speakers here. And it's a uh, no surprise to us because there was a very good seminar in Copenhagen, very interesting one. And today, there are a few things that I would like to express in this esteemed audience. First of all, and this is important, that among, amongst the things happening in international politics right now, and against the background of what President Putin said two days ago in Sochi, when he spoke about world politics, in this situation, our party holds a conference with this title, showing that we want to fight stereotypes and find common values and points for interaction. And values is an important world, word here. So I'm happy to welcome here in Moscow our colleagues from Denmark and the party with whom we have cooperated for quite a long time. In itself, it is a very important political event that we are gathering here. Second, I'd like here to focus on a few fundamental things, which I suggest uh, offer for discussion during this conference. First of all, the thing I always start with in my presentations, and this is about interaction between Russia and Europe. Let's have a look sometime into the future, like 30 to 40 years into the future. I believe in that period of time, 30 or 40 years from now, there's going to be two powerful centers of economic growth or economic power. First of all, North America, and second, Asia. Europe today already, and uh, the more so in 30 years from now, the uh, Europe would be challenged by this issue. How can it be part of this balance of forces and competition between those economic super regions? How to become part of a triangle so that Europe is part of this competitive environment. And uh, in answering this question, well, we can suggest only one thing, to find a way of interacting uh, uh, in the economic area and in the political, strategic area with the whole uh, former Soviet Union space, especially Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. I believe this is imperative. An agreement between Europe and the United States being executed trading agreement, transatlantic trading agreement. On the other hand, uh, the United States are having the same slightly different agreement with Asia Pacific. What does this mean? This means that they, uh, this is the start of very serious changes in the World Trade Organization. It would mean that the WTO, with its rules, becomes kind of secondary in importance uh, after a new concept of trading units, unions. But if we look more attentively into these agreements, as supposed to be signed be between Europe and the United States, we would be able to clearly see that it would not address the challenge I just mentioned. It will not help Europe. To the opposite, there will be high level of direct competition between American and European corporations, but it does not define strategy for future development. So. 
the question of interaction between Europe and Russia, especially in the economy, but also politics strategy, becomes a big priority on the agenda, irrespective of what is happening in Russia right now. Let me remind you that most successful in the history of, of mankind, political project most successful in the history of mankind, which is the creation of the European Union, it was conceived in 1947, immediately after the Second World War. Those ideas were declared, declared when only two years passed People were killing each other in mass. French, German, everybody killed each other. And half of Europe was under Stalin. Nonetheless, there was courage and there was wisdom to declare those goals and the necessity of a European Union. And in 60 years from that point in time, 50 to 60 years after that point in time, the European Union was established. Is it not an inspiring example for us? Is it not something we should be thinking of right now, irrespective of what is happening? Today, Russia is not a democratic country. It's an authoritarian country, half criminal, nationalistic country. This is the political system right now. The regime in Russia is the regime of power, of authority that uh, cannot be replaced. And in the economy, we have the role of oligarchs, uh, the merger of, uh, of power and uh, business. The right of ownership in uh, this system depends on the political uh, relations one has with the authorities. But it's not simply a system that we hate right now, that, well, is being adjusted, but it's still there. What I mentioned here is a strategic course. It's not just some shortcomings in the system that we would try to re uh, repair. No, this is the goal people are seeking right now. What for? To uh, retain power. Why has it happened like this? In addition to the historical background, which we can talk a lot about and argue about, in addition to that, and I'm not going to go into history today. Uh, today, in addition to that, we believe a, a decisive role was played by the mistakes we did in the reforms of the 1990s. It is a big subject. And we're quite not clear about what happened back then. It has not been properly analyzed, has not been properly understood. And this is one of the reasons why it is so difficult to develop a strategy to overcome all those problems. Another peculiar feature, which I also suggest discussing this at the seminar, is the relationships between Russia and Europe, or attitude of Europe and the West in general to what happened in Russia after 1992. Recently, in uh, Britain, there was a report uh, made, made by um, British MPs, um, British MPs, and uh, there was a, a, a nice statement there. They said European politicians were defined there as politicians when dealing with Russia. Past two decades, they were in a situation of sleepwalking, uh, lunatics. 
they invented things for themselves. They felt comfortable about that. The trade was going on, profit was coming in, and what was happening in Russia, they didn't really care. Nobody seriously took any notice of what happened in Russia, whether it must in Europe or the West as a whole. For as long as we get our profits, we are okay. They had no understanding of what was the strategy in Russia, what was the future of Russia, of the fact that we are parts that cannot really be alienated from each other. But everything was said, everything was known. Just listen to what our party members had to say. Had they done that, they would have seen the picture and would have been concerned, but they did not listen. They uh, were not serious at all. If we read the leading European periodicals, well, not name those, but especially in the middle 90s, you will be surprised. Difficult to see what kind of country they were writing about. They applauded the things happening in Russia applauding Russian reforms, everything that was taking place in Russia back then. But it was strange. Why would they do that? Uh, the President of the United States would visit Russia, meet with Boris Yeltsin, would ask him, Boris, what are you doing here? And Yeltsin said, we're doing reform. And the president uh, asked, uh, what kind of reform? President Clinton, that was Yeltsin, said, market reforms. Great, said, said Clinton. And that seemed so great. And people were watching that. Say, how in Russia, 1992, uh, our inflation was 2,600%. Uh, crime all around the place, uh, and that was the situation. Uh, in Europe, didn't people see that what was happening in Russia? People did not want to see. It was not comfortable to see all those problems. So uh, people would rather say everything's good and wonderful. Quite recently, look at the recent crisis. Suddenly, Russia stopped gas supplies to Ukraine. The European Union then got concerned, became interested. Ivan uh, uh, went earlier from uh, vacation, well, from uh, ski resorts uh, where they had uh, some good time, and they returned and started discussing the issue. But in one day, Ukraine agreed with Gazprom that gas well, the settlements for gas would be done through a small firm located in Switzerland with a charter capital of about $10,000 and turnover of $7 billion while well, located in one room in an apartment or somewhere, apartment house somewhere. And they report to the European Union, to the commissars there, Commission is there, and that uh, uh, there will be settlements and gas would be supplied. So they felt uh, relaxed and went back to their ski reserves. Uh, so what kind of issues could there be? If such subjects of international relations like Russia, Ukraine, a country with 50 million population and European Union for as long as we build our relations based on shadow arrangements, then it is no wonder what's going to be the result. And it's not that we've kept talking about that, kept attracting the attention to that. But, and Russia is an open country. It's well known, everything's well known. You can see everything in the internet. Unlike the Soviet Union, we're open. You even don't have to visit us. But once you visit us, you'll see everything. You can find everything. If you want to know something, no problem, please. The only issue 
is very few people are interested. Another example. Europe, European leaders often say, well, speak about Russia, but they are never, never uh, go to the end in that. So I have this idea. Imagine, instead of the statements they pronounced that uh, elections in Russia falsified, instead, like five to seven years ago, maybe 10 years ago, just take a decision in Europe on non-acceptance of the elections in Russia it had been falsified. Just do not recognize the election results, the composition of the state Duma. Then I do think that there would not have been that conflict in the Ukraine we are having right now. I think that would be would have been much less expensive had European leaders done that in a proper time. But now I have to admit that the rates, relations between Russia and Europe have become very cold, as you know, and very hard. And I would say, on There is a smell of war there. Five years ago, nobody could have believed in that. But today, I'm very sorry to say this. It's a serious thing. Let me stress again. The future, we have a common future. We don't have two futures, one future for all of us, whether we like it or not. Because, well, as I said, Europe, to be able to compete in the modern world, they need a uh, union with Russia. But I haven't said yet that, that without mutual penetration, mutual integration between Russia and Europe, Russia doesn't have a future. All today's anti-European course is the course leading nowhere. There is no way like that. It's a hallucination. And when sleepwalkers start doing business with people who hallucinate, then that was a big problem for the rest of the world. So please, open your eyes, everybody. Waken up and uh, understand, please, that this is a very serious business becoming ever more serious. Now, a few ideas of what can be done in this situation. First, the first thing I would like to say here is try to be critical about, let's think critically about the relations uh, widespread in Europe, the attitude rather than relations, the attitude to, to the Russian people uh, as patriarchal people, paternalistic people that would need a general to lead them. I remember euphoria some time ago in Germany when uh, General Lebed would visit uh, Germany. They wouldn't listen to him, just look at his image, his hard voice, and that was it. They, uh, Im impressive enough. The, or uh, a colonel from the special services or an oligarch or nationalistic or leftist uh, chieftain. No, this is not so. Russian people are different. And don't uh, trust opinion polls. In Russian conditions, this is an instrument, a tool people manipulate, doesn't work, does not really give you reliable information. Because people, on the one hand, are uh, under colossal pressure of propaganda, and second, they are in a state of fear. They are afraid. So what they respond in those polls does not matter, really. And don't be looking for a strong leader. Um, 
and don't 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 be over optimistic about such representatives of pseudo opposition in Russia who are often so popular in the West. Don't be euphoric about them. Uh, there are no world chess champions. Well, they are. May, they may be champions in chess, but not other things. Or former prime ministers. Please be critical about those. These are glamorous figures. And we need to, to open our eyes to what is really happening. And this means overcoming stereotypes. In this area, something we have to do. We have to do serious, deep analysis. We have to be looking for real people in Russia who would ready, be ready to sacrifice their lives, their comfort, their positions, their achievements, even their families for the country. In this audience, we have such people. And I'd like to say here that this may be the most important thing we need to do to overcome those stereotypes, to overcome stereotypes and find common values. We need to speak the truth. We need to be professional and serious people. And then it would be easy to find common values and it would be easy to overcome stereotypes. Well, it would be difficult to achieve the goals and the objectives that we have, but we have no other choice. We have, it is our obligation. We have to assure normal future in the 21st century for our country, for Russia, together with Europe. Thank you. Thank you.